for stopping by Sheila's audiobooks and I am Sheila. This recording is coming from South Texas. All stories on this recording are in the public domain per United States copyright law. This story is about an urgent cry for help brings Poirot to France. When Hercule Poirot and his associate Arthur Hastings arrive in the French village of Merlinville saw Mer to meet their client Paul Renault, they learn from the police that he has been found that morning stabbed in the back with a letter opener and left in a newly dug grave adjacent to a local golf course. Among the plausible suspects are Renault's wife Eloise, his son Jack and the mysterious Cinderella of Hastings' recent acquaintance. Poirot's powers of investigation ultimately triumph over the wiles of an assailant whose misdirection and motives are nearly but not quite impossible to spot. Mon ami, I know human nature. Throw together a boy like young Renault and a beautiful girl like Mademoiselle Mart and the result is almost inevitable. Then, the quarrel. It was money, or a woman, and, remembering Leonie's description of the lad's anger, I decided on the latter. So I made my guess, and I was right. You already suspected that she loved young Renault. Poirot smiled. At any rate, I saw that she had anxious eyes. That is how I always think of Mademoiselle Dorbroil, as the girl with the anxious eyes. His voice was so grave that it impressed me uncomfortably. What do you mean by that, Poirot? I fancy, my friend, that we shall see before very long. But I must start. I will come and see you off, I said, rising. You will do nothing of the sort. I forbid it. He was so peremptory that I stared at him in surprise. He nodded emphatically. I mean it, mon ami. Au revoir. I felt rather at a loose end after Poirot had left me. I strolled down to the beach and watched the bathers, without feeling energetic enough to join them. I rather fancied that Cinderella might be disporting herself among them in some wonderful costume, but I saw no signs of her. I strolled aimlessly along the sands towards the farther end of the town. It occurred to me that, after all, it would only be decent feeling on my part to inquire after the girl. And it would save trouble in the end. The matter would then be finished with. There would be no need for me to trouble about her any further. But if I did not go at all, she might quite possibly come and look me up at the villa. Accordingly, I left the beach, and walked inland. I soon found the Hotel du Fair, a very unpretentious building. It was annoying in the extreme not to know the lady's name and, to save my dignity, I decided to stroll inside and look around. Probably I should find her in the lounge. I went in, but there was no sign of her. I waited for some time, till my impatience got the better of me. I took the concierge aside and slipped five francs into his hand. I wish to see a lady who is staying here. A young English lady, small and dark. I am not sure of her name. The man shook his head and seemed to be suppressing a grin. There is no such lady as you describe staying here. But the lady told me she was staying here. Monsieur must have made a mistake, or it is more likely the lady did since there has been another gentleman here inquiring for her. What is that you say? I cried, surprised. But yes, monsieur. A gentleman who described her just as you have done. What was he like? He was a small gentleman, well-dressed, very neat, very spotless, the moustache very stiff, the head of a peculiar shape, and the eyes green. Poirot. So that was why he refused to let me accompany him to the station the impertinence of it. I would thank him not to meddle in my concerns. Did he fancy I needed a nurse to look after me? Thanking the man, I departed, somewhat at a loss, and still much incensed with my meddlesome friend. But where was the lady? I set aside my wrath and tried to puzzle it out. Evidently, through inadvertence, she had named the wrong hotel. Then another thought struck me. Was it inadvertence? or had she deliberately withheld her name and given me the wrong address? The more I thought about it, the more I felt convinced that this last surmise of mine was right. For some reason or other she did not wish to let the acquaintance ripen into friendship. And, though half an hour earlier this had been precisely my own view, I did not enjoy having the tables turned upon me. 
The whole affair was profoundly unsatisfactory, and I went up to the Villa Genevieve in a condition of distinct ill humor. I did not go to the house, but went up the path to the little bench by the shed, and sat there moodily enough. I was distracted from my thoughts by the sound of voices close at hand. In a second or two I realized that they came, not from the garden I was in, but from the adjoining garden of the Villa Marguerite, and that they were approaching rapidly. A girl's voice was speaking, a voice that I recognized as that of the beautiful Mart. Cherie, she was saying, is it really true? Are all our troubles over? You know it, Mart, Jack Renault replied. Nothing can part us now, beloved. The last obstacle to our union is removed. Nothing can take you from me. Nothing? The girl murmured. Oh Jack, Jack, I am afraid. I had moved to depart, realizing that I was quite unintentionally eavesdropping. As I rose to my feet, I caught sight of them through a gap in the hedge. They stood together facing me, the man's arm round the girl, his eyes looking into hers. They were a splendid-looking couple, the dark, well-knit boy, and the fair young goddess. They seemed made for each other as they stood there, happy in spite of the terrible tragedy that overshadowed their young lives. But the girl's face was troubled, and Jack Renault seemed to recognize it, as he held her closer to him and asked. But what are you afraid of, darling? What is there to fear, now? And then I saw the look in her eyes, the look Poirot had spoken of, as she murmured, so that I almost guessed at the words. I am afraid, for you. I did not hear young Renault's answer, for my attention was distracted by an unusual appearance a little farther down the hedge. There appeared to be a brown bush there, which seemed odd, to say the least of it, so early in the summer. I stepped along to investigate, but, at my advance, the brown bush withdrew itself precipitately, and faced me with a finger to its lips. It was Giraud. Enjoining caution, he led the way round the shed until we were out of earshot. What were you doing there? I asked. Exactly what you were doing, listening. But I was not there on purpose. Ah, said Giraud. I was. As always, I admired the man while disliking him. He looked me up and down with a sort of contemptuous disfavor. You didn't help matters by butting in. I might have heard something useful in a minute. What have you done with your old fossil? Monsieur Poirot has gone to Paris, I replied coldly. Giraud snapped his fingers disdainfully. So he has gone to Paris, has he? Well, a good thing. The longer he stays there the better. But what does he think he will find there? I thought I read in the question a tinge of uneasiness. I drew myself up. That I am not at liberty to say, I said quietly. Giraud subjected me to a piercing stare. He has probably enough sense not to tell you, he remarked rudely. Good afternoon. I'm busy. And with that he turned on his heel, and left me without ceremony. Matters seemed at a standstill at the Villa Genevieve. Giraud evidently did not desire my company and, from what I had seen, it seemed fairly certain that Jack Renault did not either. I went back to the town, had an enjoyable bathe, and returned to the hotel. I turned in early, wondering whether the following day would bring forth anything of interest. I was wholly unprepared for what it did bring forth. I was eating my petit déjeuner in the dining room, when the waiter, who had been talking to someone outside, came back in obvious excitement. He hesitated for a minute, fidgeting with his napkin, and then burst out. Monsieur will pardon me, but he is connected, is he not, with the affair at the Villa Genevieve? Yes, I said eagerly. Why? Monsieur has not heard the news, though. What news? That there has been another murder there last night. What? Leaving my breakfast, I caught up my hat and ran as fast as I could. Another murder, and Poirot away. What fatality! But who had been murdered? I dashed in at the gate. A group of servants were in the drive, talking and gesticulating. I caught hold of Francois. What has happened? Oh, monsieur. Monsieur. Another death. It is terrible. There is a curse upon the house, but yes, I say it, a curse. 
they should send for Monsieur le Curé to bring some holy water. Never will I sleep another night under that roof. It might be my turn, who knows? She crossed herself. Yes, I cried, but who has been killed? Do I know, me? A man, a stranger. They found him up there, in the shed, not a hundred yards from where they found poor Monsieur. And that is not all. He is stabbed, stabbed to the heart with the same dagger. Chapter 14 The Second Body Waiting for no more, I turned and ran up the path to the shed. The two men on guard there stood aside to let me pass and, filled with excitement, I entered. The light was dim, the place was a mere rough wooden erection to keep old pots and tools in. I had entered impetuously, but on the threshold I checked myself, fascinated by the spectacle before me. Giraud was on his hands and knees, a pocket torch in his hand with which he was examining every inch of the ground. He looked up with a frown at my entrance, then his face relaxed a little in a sort of good-humoured contempt. There he is, said Giraud, flashing his torch to the far corner. I stepped across. The dead man lay straight upon his back. He was of medium height, swarthy of complexion, and possibly about fifty years of age. He was neatly dressed in a dark blue suit, well cut, and probably made by an expensive tailor, but not new. His face was terribly convulsed, and on his left side, just over the heart, the hilt of a dagger stood up, black and shining. I recognized it. It was the same dagger I had seen reposing in the glass jar the preceding morning. I'm expecting the doctor any minute, explained Giraud. Although we hardly need him. There's no doubt what the man died of. He was stabbed to the heart, and death must have been pretty well instantaneous. When was it done? Last night? Giraud shook his head. Hardly. I don't lay down the law on medical evidence, but the man's been dead well over twelve hours. When do you say you last saw that dagger? About ten o'clock yesterday morning. Then I should be inclined to fix the crime as being done not long after that. But people were passing and repassing this shed continually. Giraud laughed disagreeably. You progressed to a marvel. Who told you he was killed in this shed? Well, I felt flustered. I, I assumed it. Oh, what a fine detective. Look at him. Does a man stab to the heart fall like that, neatly with his feet together, and his arms to his sides? No. Again, does a man lie down on his back and permit himself to be stabbed without raising a hand to defend himself? It is absurd, is it not? But see here, and here, he flashed the torch along the ground, I saw curious irregular marks in the soft dirt. He was dragged here after he was dead. Half dragged, half carried by two people. Their tracks do not show on the hard ground outside, and here they have been careful to obliterate them, but one of the two was a woman, my young friend. A woman? Yes. But if the tracks are obliterated, how do you know? Because, blurred as they are, the prints of the woman's shoe are unmistakable. Also, by this. And, leaning forward, he drew something from the handle of the dagger and held it up for me to see. It was a woman's long black hair, similar to the one Poirot had taken from the armchair in the library. With a slightly ironic smile he wound it round the dagger again. We will leave things as they are as much as possible, he explained. It pleases the examining magistrate. Well, do you notice anything else? I was forced to shake my head. Look at his hands. I did. The nails were broken and discolored and the skin was hard. It hardly enlightened me as much as I should have liked it to have done. I looked up at Giraud. They are not the hands of a gentleman, he said, answering my look. On the contrary, his clothes are those of a well-to-do man. That is curious, is it not? Very curious, I agreed. And none of his clothing is marked. What do we learn from that? This man was trying to pass himself off as other than he was. He was masquerading. Why? Did he fear something? Was he trying to escape by disguising himself? As yet we do not know, but one thing we do know, he was as anxious to conceal his identity as we are to discover it. He looked down at the body again. As before, 
there are no fingerprints on the handle of the dagger. The murderer again wore gloves. You think, then, that the murderer was the same in both cases? I asked eagerly. Giraud became inscrutable. Never mind what I think. We shall see. March ord. The Sergeant de Ville appeared at the door. Monsieur? Why is Madame Renault not here? I sent for her a quarter of an hour ago. She is coming up the path now, Monsieur, and her son with her. Good. I only want one at a time, though. Marchord saluted and disappeared again. A moment later he reappeared with Mrs. Renault. Here is Madame. Giraud came forward with a curt bow. This way, Madame. He led her across, and then, standing suddenly aside, here is the man. Do you know him? And as he spoke, his eyes, gimlet-like, bored into her face, seeking to read her mind, noting every indication of her manner. But Mrs. Renault remained perfectly calm, too calm, I felt. She looked down at the corpse almost without interest, certainly without any sign of agitation or recognition. No, she said. I have never seen him in my life. He is quite a stranger to me. You are sure? Quite sure. You do not recognize in him one of your assailants, for instance? No. She seemed to hesitate, as though struck by the idea. No, I do not think so. Of course they wore beards, false ones the examining magistrate thought, but still, no. Now she seemed to make her mind up definitely. I am sure neither of the two was this man. Very well, madam. That is all, then. She stepped out with head erect, the sun flashing on the silver threads in her hair. Jack Renault succeeded her. He, too, failed to identify the man in a completely natural manner. Giraud merely grunted. Whether he was pleased or chagrined I could not tell. He called to Marchord. You have got the other there. Yes, monsieur. Bring her in, then. The other was Madame Dorbroil. She came indignantly, protesting with vehemence. I object, monsieur. This is an outrage. What have I to do with all this? Madame, said Giraud brutally, I am investigating not one murder, but two murders. For all I know you may have committed them both. How dare you? She cried. How dare you insult me by such a wild accusation? It is infamous. Infamous, is it? What about this? Stooping, he again detached the hair, and held it up. Do you see this, madam? He advanced towards her. You permit that I see whether it matches? With a cry she started backwards, white to the lips. It is false, I swear it. I know nothing of the crime, of either crime. Anyone who says I do lies. Ah, oh, mon Dieu, what shall I do? Calm yourself, madam, said Giraud coldly. No one has accused you as yet. But you will do well to answer my questions without more ado. Anything you wish, monsieur. Look at the dead man. Have you ever seen him before? Drawing nearer, a little of the color creeping back to her face, Madame Dorbroil looked down at the victim with a certain amount of interest and curiosity. Then she shook her head. I do not know him. It seemed impossible to doubt her, the words came so naturally. Giraud dismissed her with a nod of the head. You are letting her go? I asked in a low voice. Is that wise? Surely that black hair is from her head. I do not need teaching my business, said Giraud dryly. She is under surveillance. I have no wish to arrest her as yet. Then, frowning, he gazed down at the body. Should you say that was a Spanish type at all? He asked suddenly. I considered the face carefully. No, I said at last. I should put him down as a Frenchman most decidedly. Giraud gave a grunt of dissatisfaction. Same here. He stood there for a moment, then with an imperative gesture he waved me aside, and once more, on hands and knees, he continued his search of the floor of the shed. He was marvellous. Nothing escaped him. Inch by inch he went over the floor, turning over pots, examining old sacks. He pounced on a bundle by the door, 
but it proved to be only a ragged coat and trousers, and he flung it down again with a snarl. Two pairs of old gloves interested him, but in the end he shook his head and laid them aside. Then he went back to the pots, methodically turning them over one by one. In the end he rose to his feet, and shook his head thoughtfully. He seemed baffled and perplexed. I think he had forgotten my presence. But at that moment a stir and bustle was heard outside, and our old friend, the examining magistrate, accompanied by his clerk and M. Bex, with the doctor behind them, came bustling in. But this is extraordinary, Monsieur Giraud, cried M. Otet. Another crime. Ah, we have not got to the bottom of this case. There is some deep mystery here. But who is the victim this time? That is just what nobody can tell us, Monsieur. He has not been identified. Where is the body? asked the doctor. Giraud moved aside a little. There in the corner. He has been stabbed to the heart, as you see. And with the dagger that was stolen yesterday morning. I fancy that the murder followed hard upon the theft, but that is for you to say. You can handle the dagger freely, there are no fingerprints on it. The doctor knelt down by the dead man, and Giraud turned to the examining magistrate. A pretty little problem, is it not? But I shall solve it. And so no one can identify him, mused the magistrate. Could it possibly be one of the assassins? They may have fallen out among themselves. Giraud shook his head. The man is a Frenchman, I would take my oath on that. But at that moment they were interrupted by the doctor, who was sitting back on his heels with a perplexed expression. You say he was killed yesterday morning? I fix it by the theft of the dagger, explained Giraud. He may, of course, have been killed later in the day. Later in the day? Fiddlesticks! This man has been dead at least forty-eight hours, and probably longer. We stared at each other in blank amazement. Chapter 15 A Photograph The doctor's words were so surprising that we were all momentarily taken aback. Here was a man stabbed with a dagger which we knew to have been stolen only twenty-four hours previously, and yet drive. Durand asserted positively that he had been dead at least forty-eight hours. The whole thing was fantastic to the last extreme. We were still recovering from the surprise of the doctor's announcement, when a telegram was brought to me. It had been sent up from the hotel to the villa. I tore it open. It was from Poirot, and announced his return by the train arriving at Merlinville at 12.28. I looked at my watch and saw that I had just time to get comfortably to the station and meet him there. I felt that it was of the utmost importance that he should know at once of the new and startling developments in the case. Evidently, I reflected, Poirot had had no difficulty in finding what he wanted in Paris. The quickness of his return proved that. Very few hours had sufficed. I wondered how he would take the exciting news I had to impart. The train was some minutes late, and I strolled aimlessly up and down the platform, until it occurred to me that I might pass the time by asking a few questions as to who had left Merlinville by the last train on the evening of the tragedy. I approached the chief porter, an intelligent-looking man, and had little difficulty in persuading him to enter upon the subject. It was a disgrace to the police, he hotly affirmed, that such brigands or assassins should be allowed to go about unpunished. I hinted that there was some possibility they might have left by the midnight train, but he negatived the idea decidedly. He would have noticed two foreigners, he was sure of it. Only about twenty people had left by the train, and he could not have failed to observe them. I do not know what put the idea into my head, possibly it was the deep anxiety underlying Marc d'Aubroil's tones, but I asked suddenly. Young Monsieur Renault, he did not leave by that train, did he? Ah, no, monsieur. To arrive and start off again within half an hour, it would not be amusing, that. I stared at the man, the significance of his words almost escaping me. Then I saw. You mean, I said, my heart beating a little, that monsieur Jack Renault arrived at Merlinville that evening? But yes, monsieur. By the last train arriving the other way, the 1140. My brain whirled. That, then, was the reason of Mart's poignant anxiety. Jack Renault had been in Merlinville on the night of the crime. 
But why had he not said so? Why, on the contrary, had he led us to believe that he had remained in Cherbourg? Remembering his frank boyish countenance, I could hardly bring myself to believe that he had any connection with the crime. Yet why this silence on his part about so vital a matter? One thing was certain, Mart had known all along. Hence her anxiety, and her eager questioning of Poirot as to whether anyone was suspected. My cogitations were interrupted by the arrival of the train, and in another moment I was greeting Poirot. The little man was radiant. He beamed and vociferated and, forgetting my English reluctance, embraced me warmly on the platform. Mon cher ami, I have succeeded, but succeeded to a marvel. Indeed? I'm delighted to hear it. Have you heard the latest here? How would you that I should hear anything? There have been some developments, eh? The brave Giro, he has made an arrest. Or even arrests, perhaps. Ah, but I will make him look foolish, that one. But where are you taking me, my friend? Do we not go to the hotel? It is necessary that I attend to my moustaches, they are deplorably limp from the heat of travelling. Also, without doubt, there is dust on my coat. And my tie, that I must rearrange. I cut short his remonstrances. My dear Poirot, never mind all that. We must go to the villa at once. There has been another murder. Never have I seen a man so flabbergasted. His jaw dropped. All the jauntiness went out of his bearing, he stared at me open-mouthed. What is that you say? Another murder? Ah, then, but I am all wrong. I have failed. Giro may mock himself at me, he will have reason. You did not expect it, then? I? Not the least in the world. It demolishes my theory, it ruins everything, it, ah, no. He stopped dead, thumping himself on the chest. It is impossible. I cannot be wrong. The facts, taken methodically, and in their proper order, admit of only one explanation. I must be right. I am right. But then. He interrupted me. Wait, my friend. I must be right, therefore this new murder is impossible unless, unless, oh, wait, I implore you. Say no word. He was silent for a moment or two, then resuming his normal manner, he said in a quiet assured voice. The victim is a man of middle age. His body was found in the locked shed near the scene of the crime and had been dead at least forty-eight hours. And it is most probable that he was stabbed in a similar manner to Mr. Renault, though not necessarily in the back. It was my turn to gape, and gape I did. In all my knowledge of Poirot he had never done anything so amazing as this. And, almost inevitably, a doubt crossed my mind. Poirot, I cried, you're pulling my leg. You've heard all about it already. He turned his earnest gaze upon me reproachfully. Would I do such a thing? I assure you that I have heard nothing whatsoever. Did you not observe the shock your news was to me? But how on earth could you know all that? I was right, then. But I knew it. The little grey cells, my friend, the little grey cells. They told me. Thus, and in no other way, could there have been a second death. Now tell me all. If we go round to the left here, we can take a short cut across the gulf links which will bring us to the back of the Villa Genevieve much more quickly. As we walked, taking the way he had indicated, I recounted all I knew. Poirot listened attentively. The dagger was in the wound, you say? That is curious. You are sure it was the same one? Absolutely certain. That's what makes it so impossible. Nothing is impossible. There may have been two daggers. I raised my eyebrows. Surely that is in the highest degree unlikely? It would be a most extraordinary coincidence. You speak as usual, without reflection, Hastings. In some cases two identical weapons would be highly improbable. But not here. This particular weapon was a war souvenir which was made to Jack Renault's orders. It is really highly unlikely, when you come to think of it, that he should have had only one made. Very probably he would have another for his own use. But nobody has mentioned such a thing, I objected, a hint of the lecturer crept into Poirot's tone. 
My friend, in working upon a case, one does not take into account only the things that are mentioned. There is no reason to mention many things which may be important. Equally, there is often an excellent reason for not mentioning them. You can take your choice of the two motives. I was silent, impressed in spite of myself. Another few minutes brought us to the famous shed. We found all our friends there, and after an interchange of polite amenities, Poirot began his task. Having watched Giraud at work, I was keenly interested. Poirot bestowed but a cursory glance on the surroundings. The only thing he examined was the ragged coat and trousers by the door. A disdainful smile rose to Giraud's lips, and, as though noting it, Poirot flung the bundle down again. Old clothes of the gardeners? He queried. Exactly, said Giraud. Poirot knelt down by the body. His fingers were rapid but methodical. He examined the texture of the clothes, and satisfied himself that there were no marks on them. The boots he subjected to special care, also the dirty and broken fingernails. While examining the latter he threw a quick question at Giraud. You saw them? Yes, I saw them, replied the other. His face remained inscrutable. Suddenly Poirot stiffened. Dr. Durand. Yes? The doctor came forward. There is foam on the lips. You observed it? I didn't notice it, I must admit. But you observe it now? Oh, certainly. Poirot again shot a question at Giraud. You noticed it without doubt? The other did not reply. Poirot proceeded. The dagger had been withdrawn from the wound. It reposed in a glass jar by the side of the body. Poirot examined it, then he studied the wound closely. When he looked up, his eyes were excited and shone with the green light I knew so well. It is a strange wound, this. It has not bled. There is no stain on the clothes. The blade of the dagger is slightly discolored, that is all. What do you think, Monsieur le Docteur? I can only say that it is most abnormal. It is not abnormal at all. It is most simple. The man was stabbed after he was dead. And, stilling the clamor of voices that arose with a wave of his hand, Poirot turned to Giraud and added, M. Giraud agrees with me, do you not, monsieur? Whatever Giraud's real belief, he accepted the position without moving a muscle. Calmly and almost scornfully he replied, Certainly I agree. The murmur of surprise and interest broke out again. But what an idea! cried M. Otet. To stab a man after he is dead. Barbaric. Unheard of. Some unappeasable hate perhaps. No, said Poirot, I should fancy it was done quite cold-bloodedly, to create an impression. What impression? The impression it nearly did create, returned Poirot oracularly. M. Bex had been thinking. How, then, was the man killed? He was not killed. He died. He died, if I am not much mistaken, of an epileptic fit. This statement of Poirot's again aroused considerable excitement. Dr. Durand knelt down again, and made a searching examination. At last he rose to his feet. Monsieur Poirot, I am inclined to believe that you are correct in your assertion. I was misled to begin with. The incontrovertible fact that the man had been stabbed distracted my attention from any other indications. Poirot was the hero of the hour. The examining magistrate was profuse in compliments. Poirot responded gracefully, and then excused himself on the pretext that neither he nor I had yet lunched, and that he wished to repair the ravages of the journey. As we were about to leave the shed, Giraud approached us. One other thing, Monsieur Poirot, he said, in his suave mocking voice. We found this coiled round the handle of the dagger, a woman's hair. Ah, said Poirot. A woman's hair. What woman's, I wonder? I wonder also, said Giraud. Then, with a bow, he left us. He was insistent, the good Giraud, said Poirot thoughtfully, as we walked towards the hotel. I wonder in what direction he hopes to mislead me? A woman's hair, hmm. We lunched heartily, but I found Poirot somewhat distray and inattentive. Afterwards we went up to our sitting room, 
and there I begged him to tell me something of his mysterious journey to Paris. Willingly, my friend. I went to Paris to find this. He took from his pocket a small faded newspaper cutting. It was the reproduction of a woman's photograph. He handed it to me. I uttered an exclamation. You recognize it, my friend? I nodded. Although the photo obviously dated from very many years back, and the hair was dressed in a different style, the likeness was unmistakable. Madame Dorbroil, I exclaimed. Poirot shook his head with a smile. Not quite correct, my friend. She did not call herself by that name in those days. That is a picture of the notorious Madame Biroldi. Madame Biroldi. In a flash the whole thing came back to me. The murder trial that had evoked such worldwide interest. The Biroldi case. Chapter 16 The Biroldi case. Some twenty years or so before the opening of the present story, Monsieur Arnold Biroldi, a native of Lyons, arrived in Paris accompanied by his pretty wife and their little daughter, a mere babe. Monsieur Biroldi was a junior partner in a firm of wine merchants, a stout middle-aged man, fond of the good things of life, devoted to his charming wife, and altogether unremarkable in every way. The firm in which Monsieur Biroldi was a partner was a small one and, although doing well, it did not yield a large income to the junior partner. The Biroldis had a small apartment and lived in a very modest fashion to begin with. But, unremarkable though Monsieur Biroldi might be, his wife was plentifully gilded with the brush of romance. Young and good-looking, and gifted withal with a singular charm of manner, Madame Biroldi at once created a stir in the quarter, especially when it began to be whispered that some interesting mystery surrounded her birth. It was rumored that she was the illegitimate daughter of a Russian grand duke. Others asserted that it was an Austrian archduke, and that the union was legal, though morganatic. But all stories agreed upon one point, that Jean Biroldi was the center of an interesting mystery. Among the friends and acquaintances of the Biroldis was a young lawyer, Georges Conno. It was soon evident that the fascinating Jeanne had completely enslaved his heart. Madame Biroldi encouraged the young man in a discreet fashion, but always being careful to affirm her complete devotion to her middle-aged husband. Nevertheless, many spiteful persons did not hesitate to declare that young Conno was her lover, and not the only one. When the Biroldis had been in Paris about three months, another personage came upon the scene. This was Mr. Hiram P. Trapp, a native of the United States, and extremely wealthy. Introduced to the charming and mysterious Madame Biroldi, he fell a prompt victim to her fascinations. His admiration was obvious, though strictly respectful. About this time, Madame Biroldi became more outspoken in her confidences. To several friends, she declared herself greatly worried on her husband's behalf. She explained that he had been drawn into several schemes of a political nature, and also referred to some important papers that had been entrusted to him for safekeeping and which concerned a secret of far-reaching European importance. They had been entrusted to his custody to throw pursuers off the track, but Madame Biroldi was nervous, having recognized several important members of the revolutionary circle in Paris. On the 28th day of November the blow fell. The woman who came daily to clean and cook for the Biroldis was surprised to find the door of the apartment standing wide open. Hearing faint moans issuing from the bedroom, she went in. A terrible sight met her eyes. Madame Biroldi lay on the floor bound hand and foot, uttering feeble moans, having managed to free her mouth from a gag. On the bed was Monsieur Biroldi, lying in a pool of blood, with a knife driven through his heart. Madame Biroldi's story was clear enough. Suddenly awakened from sleep, she had discerned two masked men bending over her. Stifling her cries, they had bound and gagged her. They had then demanded of Monsieur Biroldi the famous secret. But the intrepid wine merchant refused point-blank to accede to their request. Angered by his refusal, one of the men incontinently stabbed him through the heart. With the dead man's keys, they had opened the safe in the corner, and had carried away with them a mass of papers. Both men were heavily bearded, and had worn masks, but Madame Biroldi declared positively that they were Russians. The affair created an immense sensation. Time went on, and the mysterious bearded men were never traced. And then, 
Just as public interest was beginning to die down, a startling development occurred. Madame Baroldi was arrested and charged with the murder of her husband. The trial, when it came on, aroused widespread interest. The youth and beauty of the accused, and her mysterious history, were sufficient to make of it a cause célèbre. It was proved beyond doubt that Jeanne Baroldi's parents were a highly respectable and prosaic couple, fruit merchants, who lived on the outskirts of Lyons. The Russian Grand Duke, the court intrigues, and the political schemes, all the stories current were traced back to the lady herself. Remorselessly, the whole story of her life was laid bare. The motive for the murder was found in Mr. Hiram P. Trapp. Mr. Trapp did his best, but, relentlessly and agilely cross-questioned, he was forced to admit that he loved the lady, and that, had she been free, he would have asked her to be his wife. The fact that the relations between them were admittedly platonic strengthened the case against the accused. Debarred from becoming his mistress by the simple honorable nature of the man, Jeanne Baroldi had conceived the monstrous project of ridding herself of her elderly, undistinguished husband and becoming the wife of the rich American. Throughout, Madame Baroldi confronted her accusers with complete sangfroid and self-possession. Her story never varied. She continued to declare strenuously that she was of royal birth and that she had been substituted for the daughter of the fruit seller at an early age. Absurd and completely unsubstantiated as these statements were, a great number of people believed implicitly in their truth. But the prosecution was implacable. It denounced the masked Russians as a myth, and asserted that the crime had been committed by Madame Baroldi and her lover, Georges Conno. A warrant was issued for the arrest of the latter, but he had wisely disappeared. Evidence showed that the bonds which secured Madame Baroldi were so loose that she could easily have freed herself. And then, towards the close of the trial, a letter, posted in Paris, was sent to the public prosecutor. It was from Georges Conno and, without revealing his whereabouts, it contained a full confession of the crime. He declared that he had indeed struck the fatal blow at Madame Baroldi's instigation. The crime had been planned between them. Believing that her husband ill-treated her, and maddened by his own passion for her, a passion which he believed her to return, he had planned the crime and struck the fatal blow that should free the woman he loved from a hateful bondage. Now, for the first time, he learnt of Mr. Hiram P. Trapp, and realised that the woman he loved had betrayed him. Not for his sake did she wish to be free, but in order to marry the wealthy American. She had used him as a cat's paw, and now, in his jealous rage, he turned and denounced her, declaring that throughout he had acted at her instigation. And then Madame Baroldi proved herself the remarkable woman she undoubtedly was. Without hesitation, she dropped her previous defense, and admitted that the Russians were a pure invention on her part. The real murderer was Georges Conno. Maddened by passion, he had committed the crime, vowing that if she did not keep silence he would exact a terrible vengeance from her. Terrified by his threats, she had consented, also fearing it likely that if she told the truth she might be accused of conniving at the crime. But she had steadfastly refused to have anything more to do with her husband's murderer, and it was in revenge for this attitude on her part that he had written this letter accusing her. She swore solemnly that she had had nothing to do with the planning of the crime, that she had awoke on that memorable night to find George's Conno standing over her, the blood-stained knife in his hand. It was a touch-and-go affair. Madame Baroldi's story was hardly credible. But her address to the jury was a masterpiece. The tears streaming down her face, she spoke of her child, of her woman's honor, of her desire to keep her reputation untarnished for the child's sake. She admitted that, George's Conno having been her lover, she might perhaps be held morally responsible for the crime, but, before God, nothing more. She knew that she had committed a grave fault in not denouncing Conno to the law, but she declared in a broken voice that that was a thing no woman could have done. She had loved him. Could she let her hand be the one to send him to the guillotine? She had been guilty of much, but she was innocent of the terrible crime imputed to her. However that may have been, her eloquence and personality won the day. Madame Baroldi, amidst a scene of unparalleled excitement, was acquitted. Despite the utmost endeavors of the police, George's Conno was never traced. 
As for Madame Biroldi, nothing more was heard of her. Taking the child with her, she left Paris to begin a new life. Chapter 17 We Make Further Investigations I have set down the Baroldi case in full. Of course all the details did not present themselves to my memory as I have recounted them here. Nevertheless, I recalled the case fairly accurately. It had attracted a great deal of interest at the time, and had been fully reported by the English papers, so that it did not need much effort of memory on my part to recollect the salient details. Just for the moment, in my excitement, it seemed to clear up the whole matter. I admit that I am impulsive, and Poirot deplores my custom of jumping to conclusions, but I think I had some excuse in this instance. The remarkable way in which this discovery justified Poirot's point of view struck me at once. Poirot, I said, I congratulate you. I see everything now. Poirot lit one of his little cigarettes with his usual precision. Then he looked up. And since you see everything now, mon ami, what exactly is it that you see? Why, that it was Madame Dorbroil, Baroldi, who murdered Mr. Renault. The similarity of the two cases proves that beyond a doubt. Then you consider that Madame Baroldi was wrongly acquitted? That in actual fact she was guilty of connivance in her husband's murder? I opened my eyes wide. Of course. Don't you? Poirot walked to the end of the room, absent-mindedly straightened a chair, and then said thoughtfully. Yes, that is my opinion. But there is no of course about it, my friend. Technically speaking, Madame Baroldi is innocent. Of that crime, perhaps. But not of this. Poirot sat down again, and regarded me, his thoughtful air more marked than ever. So it is definitely your opinion, Hastings, that Madame Dorbroil murdered Monsieur Renault? Yes. Why? He shot the question at me with such suddenness that I was taken aback. Why? I stammered. Why? Oh, because, I came to a stop. Poirot nodded his head at me. You see, you come to a stumbling block at once. Why should Madame Dorbroil, I shall call her that for clearness' sake, murder Monsieur Renault? We can find no shadow of a motive. She does not benefit by his death, considered as either mistress or blackmailer she stands to lose. You cannot have a murder without motive. The first crime was different, though we had a rich lover waiting to step into her husband's shoes. Money is not the only motive for murder, I objected. True, agreed Poirot placidly. There are two others, the crime passional is one. And there is the third rare motive, murder for an idea, which implies some form of mental derangement on the part of the murderer. Homicidal mania and religious fanaticism belong to that class. We can rule it out here. But what about the crime passional? Can you rule that out? If Madame Dorbroil was Renault's mistress, if she found that his affection was cooling, or if her jealousy was aroused in any way, might she not have struck him down in a moment of anger? Poirot shook his head. If, I say if, you note, Madame Dorbroil was Renault's mistress, he had not had time to tire of her. And in any case you mistake her character, she is a woman who can simulate great emotional stress. She is a magnificent actress. But, looked at dispassionately, her life disproves her appearance. Throughout, if we examine it, she has been cold-blooded and calculating in her motives and actions. It was not to link her life with that of her young lover that she connived at her husband's murder. The rich American, for whom she probably did not care a button, was her objective. If she committed a crime, she would always do so for gain. Here there was no gain. Besides, how do you account for the digging of the grave? That was a man's work. She might have had an accomplice, I suggested, unwilling to relinquish my belief. I passed to another objection. You have spoken of the similarity between the two crimes. Wherein does that lie, my friend? I stared at him in astonishment. Why, Poirot, it was you who remarked on that. The story of the masked men, the secret, the papers. Poirot smiled a little. Do not be so indignant, I beg of you. I repudiate nothing. The similarity of the two stories links the two cases together inevitably. But reflect now on something very curious. 
It is not Madame Dorbroil who tells us this tale, if it were, all would indeed be plain sailing, it is Madame Renault. Is she then in league with the other? I can't believe that, I said slowly. If she is, she must be the most consummate actress the world has ever known. Totata, said Poirot impatiently. Again you have the sentiment and not the logic. If it is necessary for a criminal to be a consummate actress, then by all means assume her to be one. But is it necessary? I do not believe Mrs. Renault to be in league with Madame Dorbroil for several reasons, some of which I have already enumerated to you. The others are self-evident. Therefore, that possibility eliminated, we draw very near to the truth, which is, as always, very curious and interesting. Poirot, I cried, what more do you know? Mon ami, you must make your own deductions. You have access to the facts. Concentrate your grey cells. Reason, not like Giraud, but like Hercule Poirot. But are you sure? My friend, in many ways I have been an imbecile. But at last I see clearly. You know everything? I have discovered what Monsieur Renault sent for me to discover. And you know the murderer? I know one murderer. What do you mean? We talk a little at cross purposes. There are here not one crime, but two. The first I have solved, the second, eh bien, I will confess, I am not sure. But, Poirot, I thought you said the man in the shed had died a natural death. Totata. Poirot made his favorite ejaculation of impatience, still you do not understand. One may have a crime without a murderer, but for two crimes it is essential to have two bodies. His remark struck me as so peculiarly lacking in lucidity that I looked at him in some anxiety. But he appeared perfectly normal. Suddenly he rose and strolled to the window. Here he is, he observed. Who? Monsieur Jack Renault. I sent a note up to the villa to ask him to come here. That changed the course of my ideas, and I asked Poirot if he knew that Jack Renault had been in Merlinville on the night of the crime. I had hoped to catch my astute little friend napping, but as usual he was omniscient. He, too, had inquired at the station. And without doubt we are not original in the idea, Hastings. The excellent Giro, he also has probably made his inquiries. You don't think, I said, and then stopped. Ah, no, it would be too horrible. Poirot looked inquiringly at me, but I said no more. It had just occurred to me that though there were seven women, directly and indirectly connected with the case, Mrs. Renault, Madame Dorbroil and her daughter, the mysterious visitor, and the three servants, there was, with the exception of old Auguste, who could hardly count, only one man, Jack Renault and a man must have dug the grave. I had no time to develop farther the appalling idea that had occurred to me, for Jack Renault was ushered into the room. Poirot greeted him in businesslike manner. Take a seat, monsieur. I regret infinitely to derange you, but you will perhaps understand that the atmosphere of the villa is not too congenial to me. Monsieur Giraud and I do not see eye to eye about everything. His politeness to me has not been striking, and you will comprehend that I do not intend any little discoveries I may make to benefit him in any way. Exactly, Monsieur Poirot, said the lad. That fellow Giraud is an ill-conditioned brute, and I'd be delighted to see someone score at his expense. Then I may ask a little favor of you? Certainly. I will ask you to go to the railway station and take a train to the next station along the line, Abalac. Ask at the cloakroom whether two foreigners deposited a valise there on the night of the murder. It is a small station, and they are almost certain to remember. Will you do this? Of course I will, said the boy, mystified, though ready for the task. I and my friend, you comprehend, have business elsewhere, explained Poirot. There is a train in a quarter of an hour, and I will ask you not to return to the villa, as I have no wish for Giraud to get an inkling of your errand. Very well, I will go straight to the station. He rose to his feet. Poirot's voice stopped him. One moment, Monsieur Renault, there is one little matter that puzzles me. Why did you not mention to Monsieur Otet this morning that you were in Merlinville on the night of the crime? Jack Renault's face went crimson. 
With an effort he controlled himself. You have made a mistake. I was in Cherbourg as I told the examining magistrate this morning. Poirot looked at him, his eyes narrowed, cat-like, until they only showed a gleam of green. Then it is a singular mistake that I have made there, for it is shared by the station staff. They say you arrived by the 1140 train. For a moment Jack Renault hesitated, then he made up his mind. And if I did? I suppose you do not mean to accuse me of participating in my father's murder? He asked the question haughtily, his head thrown back. I should like an explanation of the reason that brought you here. That is simple enough. I came to see my fiancée, Mademoiselle Dorbroil. I was on the eve of a long voyage, uncertain as to when I should return. I wished to see her before I went, to assure her of my unchanging devotion. And did you see her? Poirot's eyes never left the other's face. There was an appreciable pause before Renault replied. Then he said, Yes. And afterwards? I found I had missed the last train. I walked to Street Beauvais, where I knocked up a garage and got a car to take me back to Cherbourg. Street Beauvais? That is fifteen kilometers. A long walk, M. Renault. I, I felt like walking. Poirot bowed his head as a sign that he accepted the explanation. Jack Renault took up his hat and cane and departed. In a trice Poirot jumped to his feet. Quick, Hastings. We will go after him. Keeping a discreet distance behind our quarry, we followed him through the streets of Merlinville. But when Poirot saw that he took the turning to the station he checked himself. All is well. He has taken the bait. He will go to Abilac, and will inquire for the mythical valise left by the mythical foreigners. Yes, mon ami, all that was a little invention of my own. You wanted him out of the way. I exclaimed. Your penetration is amazing, Hastings. Now, if you please, we will go up to the Villa Genevieve. Chapter 18 Giro Acts Arrived at the villa, Poirot led the way up to the shed where the second body had been discovered. He did not, however, go in, but paused by the bench which I have mentioned before as being set some few yards away from it. After contemplating it for a moment or two, he paced carefully from it to the hedge which marked the boundary between the Villa Genevieve and the Villa Marguerite. Then he paced back again, nodding his head as he did so. Returning again to the hedge, he parted the bushes with his hands. With good fortune, he remarked to me over his shoulder, Mademoiselle Mart may find herself in the garden. I desire to speak to her and would prefer not to call formally at the Villa Marguerite. Ah, all is well, there she is. P.S.T., Mademoiselle. P.S.T. Un moment, s'il vous plaît. I joined him at the moment that Mart Dorbroil, looking slightly startled, came running up to the hedge at his call. A little word with you, Mademoiselle, if it is permitted? Certainly, Monsieur Poirot. Despite her acquiescence, her eyes looked troubled and afraid. Mademoiselle, do you remember running after me on the road the day that I came to your house with the examining magistrate? You asked me if anyone were suspected of the crime. And you told me two Chileans. Her voice sounded rather breathless, and her left hand stole to her breast. Will you ask me the same question again, mademoiselle? What do you mean? This. If you were to ask me that question again, I should give you a different answer. Someone is suspected, but not a Chilean. Who? The word came faintly between her parted lips. Monsieur Jack Renault. What? It was a cry. Jack? Impossible. Who dares to suspect him? Giro. Giro. The girl's face was ashy. I am afraid of that man. He is cruel. He will, he will, she broke off. There was courage gathering in her face, and determination. I realized in that moment that she was a fighter. Poirot, too, watched her intently. You know, of course, that he was here on the night of the murder? He asked. Yes, she replied mechanically. He told me. It was unwise to have tried to conceal the fact, ventured Poirot. Yes, yes, she replied impatiently. 
But we cannot waste time on regrets. We must find something to save him. He is innocent, of course, but that will not help him with a man like Jiro, who has his reputation to think of. He must arrest someone, and that someone will be Jack. The facts will tell against him, said Poirot. You realize that? She faced him squarely. I am not a child, monsieur. I can be brave and look facts in the face. He is innocent, and we must save him. She spoke with a kind of desperate energy, then was silent, frowning as she thought. Mademoiselle, said Poirot, observing her keenly, is there not something that you are keeping back that you could tell us? She nodded perplexedly. Yes, there is something, but I hardly know whether you will believe it, it seems so absurd. At any rate, tell us, mademoiselle. It is this. M. Giraud sent for me, as an afterthought, to see if I could identify the man in there. She signed with her head towards the shed. I could not. At least I could not at the moment. But since I have been thinking. Well. It seems so queer, and yet I am almost sure. I will tell you. On the morning of the day Monsieur Renault was murdered, I was walking in the garden here, when I heard a sound of men's voices quarreling. I pushed aside the bushes and looked through. One of the men was Monsieur Renault and the other was a tramp, a dreadful looking creature in filthy rags. He was alternately whining and threatening. I gathered he was asking for money, but at that moment Mammon called me from the house, and I had to go. That is all, only, I am almost sure that the tramp and the dead man in the shed are one and the same. Poirot uttered an exclamation. But why did you not say at the time, mademoiselle? Because at first it only struck me that the face was vaguely familiar in some way. The man was differently dressed, and apparently belonged to a superior station in life. A voice called from the house. Mammon, whispered Mart, I must go. And she slipped away through the trees. Come, said Poirot and, taking my arm, turned in the direction of the villa. What do you really think? I asked in some curiosity. Was that story true, or did the girl make it up in order to divert suspicion from her lover? It is a curious tale, said Poirot, but I believe it to be the absolute truth. Unwittingly, Mademoiselle Mart told us the truth on another point, and incidentally gave Jack Renault the lie. Did you notice his hesitation when I asked him if he saw Mart Dobroyle on the night of the crime? He paused and then said yes. I suspected that he was lying. It was necessary for me to see Mademoiselle Mart before he could put her on her guard. Three little words gave me the information I wanted. When I asked her if she knew that Jack Renault was here that night, she answered, he told me. Now, Hastings, what was Jack Renault doing here on that eventful evening? and if he did not see Mademoiselle Mart whom did he see? Surely, Poirot, I cried, aghast, you cannot believe that a boy like that would murder his own father. Mon ami, said Poirot, you continue to be of a sentimentality unbelievable. I have seen mothers who murdered their little children for the sake of the insurance money. After that, one can believe anything. And the motive? Money of course. Remember that Jack Renault thought that he would come into half his father's fortune at the latter's death. But the tramp. Where does he come in? Poirot shrugged his shoulders, Giraud would say that he was an accomplice, an Apache who helped young Renault to commit the crime, and who was conveniently put out of the way afterwards. But the hair round the dagger? The woman's hair? Ah, said Poirot, smiling broadly. That is the cream of Giraud's little jest. According to him, it is not a woman's hair at all. Remember that the youths of today wear their hair brushed straight back from the forehead with pomade or hair wash to make it lie flat. Consequently some of the hairs are of considerable length. And you believe that too? No, said Poirot, with a curious smile. For I know it to be the hair of a woman, and more, which woman? Madame Dorbroil. I announced positively. Perhaps, said Poirot, regarding me quizzically. But I refused to allow myself to get annoyed. What are we going to do now? I asked, as we entered the hall of the Villa Genevieve. I wished to make a search among the effects of M. Jack Renault. 
That is why I had to get him out of the way for a few hours. Neatly and methodically, Poirot opened each drawer in turn, examined the contents, and returned them exactly to their places. It was a singularly dull and uninteresting proceeding. Poirot waded on through collars, pajamas, and socks. A purring noise outside drew me to the window. Instantly I became galvanized into life. Poirot. I cried. A car has just driven up. Giraud is in it, and Jack Renault, and two gendarmes. Sacre tonnerre, growled Poirot. That animal of a Giraud, could he not wait? I shall not be able to replace the things in this last drawer with the proper method. Let us be quick. Unceremoniously he tumbled out the things on the floor, mostly ties and handkerchiefs. Suddenly with a cry of triumph Poirot pounced on something, a small square of cardboard, evidently a photograph. Thrusting it into his pocket, he returned the things pell-mell to the drawer, and seizing me by the arm dragged me out of the room and down the stairs. In the hall stood Giraud, contemplating his prisoner. Good afternoon, Monsieur Giraud, said Poirot. What have we here? Giraud nodded his head towards Jack. He was trying to make a getaway, but I was too sharp for him. He's under arrest for the murder of his father, Monsieur Paul Renault. Poirot wheeled round to confront the boy, who was leaning limply against the door, his face ashy pale. What do you say to that, jeune homme? Jack Renault stared at him stonily. Nothing, he said. Chapter 19 I use my grey cells. I was dumbfounded. Up to the last, I had not been able to bring myself to believe Jack Renault guilty. I had expected a ringing proclamation of his innocence when Poirot challenged him, but now, watching him as he stood, white and limp against the wall, and hearing the damning admission fall from his lips, I doubted no longer. But Poirot had turned to Giraud. What are your grounds for arresting him? Do you expect me to give them to you? As a matter of courtesy, yes. Giraud looked at him doubtfully. He was torn between a desire to refuse rudely and the pleasure of triumphing over his adversary. You think I have made a mistake, I suppose? He sneered. It would not surprise me, replied Poirot, with a soupçon of malice. Giraud's face took on a deeper tinge of red. Eh bien, come in here. You shall judge for yourself. He flung open the door of the salon, and we passed in, leaving Jack Renault in the care of the two other men. Now, Monsieur Poirot, said Giraud, laying his hat on the table, and speaking with the utmost sarcasm, I will treat you to a little lecture on detective work. I will show how we moderns work, Yan, said Poirot, composing himself to listen. I will show you how admirably the old guard can listen. And he leaned back and closed his eyes, opening them for a moment to remark, Do not fear that I shall sleep. I will attend most carefully. Of course, began Giraud, I soon saw through all that chilling tomfoolery. Two men were in it, but they were not mysterious foreigners. All that was a blind. Very creditable so far, my dear Giraud, murmured Poirot. Especially after that clever trick of theirs with the match and cigarette end. Giraud glared, but continued. A man must have been connected with the case, in order to dig the grave. There is no man who actually benefits by the crime, but there was a man who thought he would benefit. I heard of Jack Renault's quarrel with his father, and of the threats that he had used. The motive was established. Now as to means. Jack Renault was in Merlinville that night. He concealed the fact, which turned suspicion into certainty. Then we found a second victim, stabbed with the same dagger. We know when that dagger was stolen. Captain Hastings here can fix the time. Jack Renault, arriving from Cherbourg, was the only person who could have taken it. I have accounted for all the other members of the household. Poirot interrupted. You are wrong. There is one other person who could have taken the dagger. You refer to Monsieur Stoner? He arrived at the front door, in an automobile which had brought him straight from Calais. Ah! Believe me, I have looked into everything. Monsieur Jack Renault arrived by train. An hour elapsed between his arrival and the moment when he presented himself at the house. Without doubt, 
he saw Captain Hastings and his companion leave the shed, slipped in himself and took the dagger, stabbed his accomplice in the shed. Who was already dead? Giraud shrugged his shoulders. Possibly he did not observe that. He may have judged him to be sleeping. Without doubt they had a rendezvous. In any case he knew this apparent second murder would greatly complicate the case. It did. But it could not deceive Monsieur Giraud, murmured Poirot. You mock at me. But I will give you one last irrefutable proof. Madame Renault's story was false, a fabrication from beginning to end. We believe Madame Renault to have loved her husband, yet she lied to shield his murderer. For whom will a woman lie? Sometimes for herself, usually for the man she loves, always for her children. That is the last, the irrefutable proof. You cannot get round it. Giraud paused, flushed and triumphant. Poirot regarded him steadily. That is my case, said Giraud. What have you to say to it, only that there is one thing you have failed to take into account? What is that? Jack Renault was presumably acquainted with the planning out of the golf course. He knew that the body would be discovered almost at once, when they started to dig the bunker. Giraud laughed out loud. But it is idiotic what you say there. He wanted the body to be found. Until it was found, he could not presume death, and would have been unable to enter into his inheritance. I saw a quick flash of green in Poirot's eyes as he rose to his feet. Then why bury it? He asked very softly. Reflect, Giraud. Since it was to Jack Renault's advantage that the body should be found without delay, why dig a grave at all? Giraud did not reply. The question found him unprepared. He shrugged his shoulders as though to intimate that it was of no importance. Poirot moved towards the door. I followed him. There is one more thing that you have failed to take into account, he said over his shoulder. What is that? The piece of lead piping, said Poirot, and left the room. Jack Renault still stood in the hall, with a white dumb face, but as we came out of the salon he looked up sharply. At the same moment there was the sound of a footfall on the staircase. Mrs. Renault was descending it. At the sight of her son, standing between the two myrmidons of the law, she stopped as though petrified. Jack, she faltered. Jack, what is this? He looked up at her, his face set. They have arrested me, mother. What? She uttered a piercing cry, and before anyone could get to her, swayed, and fell heavily. We both ran to her and lifted her up. In a minute Poirot stood up again. She has cut her head badly, on the corner of the stairs. I fancy there is slight concussion also. If Giraud wants a statement from her, he will have to wait. She will probably be unconscious for at least a week. Denise and Francois had run to their mistress, and leaving her in their charge Poirot left the house. He walked with his head down, frowning thoughtfully. For some time I did not speak, but at last I ventured to put a question to him. Do you believe then, in spite of all appearances to the contrary, that Jack Renault may not be guilty? Poirot did not answer at once, but after a long wait he said gravely, I do not know, Hastings. There is just a chance of it. Of course Giraud is all wrong, wrong from beginning to end. If Jack Renault is guilty, it is in spite of Giraud's arguments, not because of them and the gravest indictment against him is known only to me. What is that? I asked, impressed. If you would use your grey cells, and see the whole case clearly as I do, you too would perceive it, my friend. This was what I called one of Poirot's irritating answers. He went on, without waiting for me to speak. Let us walk this way to the sea. We will sit on that little mound there, overlooking the beach, and review the case. You shall know all that I know, but I would prefer that you should come at the truth by your own efforts, not by my leading you by the hand. We established ourselves on the grassy knoll as Poirot had suggested, looking out to sea. Think, my friend, said Poirot's voice encouragingly. Arrange your ideas. Be methodical. Be orderly. There is the secret of success. I endeavoured to obey him, casting my mind back over all the details of the case. 
and suddenly I started as an idea of bewildering luminosity shot into my brain. Tremblingly I built up my hypothesis. You have a little idea, I see, mon ami. Capital. We progress. I sat up, and lit a pipe. Poirot, I said, it seems to me we have been strangely remiss. I say we, although I dare say I would be nearer the mark. But you must pay the penalty of your determined secrecy. So I say again we have been strangely remiss. There is someone we have forgotten. And who is that? inquired Poirot, with twinkling eyes. George's Conno. Chapter 20 An Amazing Statement The next moment Poirot embraced me warmly on the cheek. Enfin. You have arrived. And all by yourself. It is superb. Continue your reasoning. You are right. Decidedly we have done wrong to forget George's Conno. I was so flattered by the little man's approval that I could hardly continue. But at last I collected my thoughts and went on. George's Conno disappeared twenty years ago, but we have no reason to believe that he is dead. Or Cunement, agreed Poirot. Proceed. Therefore we will assume that he is alive. Exactly. Or that he was alive until recently. De mieux en mieux. We will presume, I continued, my enthusiasm rising, that he has fallen on evil days. He has become a criminal, an Apache, a tramp, a what you will. He chances to come to Merlinville. There he finds the woman he has never ceased to love. A. A. The sentimentality, warned Poirot. Where one hates one also loves, I quoted or misquoted. At any rate he finds her there, living under an assumed name. But she has a new lover, the Englishman, Renault. George's Conno, the memory of old wrongs rising in him, quarrels with this Renault. He lies in wait for him as he comes to visit his mistress, and stabs him in the back. Then, terrified at what he has done, he starts to dig a grave. I imagine it likely that Madame Dorbroil comes out to look for her lover. She and Conno have a terrible scene, he drags her into the shed, and there suddenly falls down in an epileptic fit. Now supposing Jack Renault to appear. Madame Dorbroil tells him all, points out to him the dreadful consequences to her daughter if this scandal of the past is revived. His father's murderer is dead, let them do their best to hush it up. Jack Renault consents, goes to the house and has an interview with his mother, winning her over to his point of view. Primed with the story that Madame Dorbroil has suggested to him, she permits herself to be gagged and bound. There, Poirot, what do you think of that? I leaned back, flushed with the pride of successful reconstruction. Poirot looked at me thoughtfully. I think that you should write for the kinema, mon ami, he remarked at last. You mean? It would mean a good film, the story that you have recounted to me there, but it bears no sort of resemblance to everyday life. I admit that I haven't gone into all the details, but... You have gone farther, you have ignored them magnificently. What about the way the two men were dressed? Do you suggest that after stabbing his victim, Conno removed his suit of clothes, donned it himself, and replaced the dagger? I don't see that that matters, I objected rather huffily. He may have obtained clothes and money from Madame Dorbroil by threats earlier in the day. By threats, eh? You seriously advance that supposition? Certainly. He could have threatened to reveal her identity to the Reynolds, which would probably have put an end to all hopes of her daughter's marriage. You are wrong, Hastings. He could not blackmail her, for she had the whip hand. George's Conno, remember, is still wanted for murder. A word from her and he is in danger of the guillotine. I was forced, rather reluctantly, to admit the truth of this. Your theory, I remarked acidly, is doubtless correct as to all the details. My theory is the truth, said Poirot quietly. And the truth is necessarily correct. In your theory you made a fundamental error. You permitted your imagination to lead you astray with midnight assignations and passionate love scenes but in investigating crime we must take our stand upon the commonplace. Shall I demonstrate my methods to you? Oh, by all means let us have a demonstration. Poirot sat very upright and began, 
wagging his forefinger emphatically to emphasize his points. I will start as you started from the basic fact of George's Cono. Now the story told by Madame Baroldi in court as to the Russians was admittedly a fabrication. If she was innocent of connivance in the crime, it was concocted by her, and by her only as she stated, if, on the other hand, she was not innocent, it might have been invented by either her or George's Cono. Now, in this case we are investigating, we meet the same tale. As I pointed out to you, the facts render it very unlikely that Madame Dorbroil inspired it. So we turn to the hypothesis that the story had its origin in the brain of George's Cono. Very good. George's Cono, therefore, planned the crime, with Mrs. Renault as his accomplice. She is in the limelight, and behind her is a shadowy figure whose present alias is unknown to us. Now let us go carefully over the Renault case from the beginning, setting down each significant point in its chronological order. You have a notebook and pencil? Good. Now what is the earliest point to note down? The letter to you? That was the first we knew of it, but it is not the proper beginning of the case. The first point of any significance, I should say, is the change that came over Monsieur Renault shortly after arriving in Merlinville, and which is attested to by several witnesses. We have also to consider his friendship with Madame Dorbroil, and the large sums of money paid over to her. From thence we can come directly to the 23rd May. Poirot paused, cleared his throat, and signed to me to write. 23rd May. M. Renault quarrels with his son over latter's wish to marry Mart d'Aubroil. Son leaves for Paris. 24th May. M. Renault alters his will, leaving entire control of his fortune in his wife's hands. 7th June. Quarrel with Tramp in garden, witnessed by Mart d'Aubroil. Letter written to M. Hercule Poirot imploring assistance. Telegram sent to M. Jack Renault, bidding him proceed by the Anzara to Buenos Aires. Chauffeur, masters, sent off on a holiday. Visit of a lady that evening. As he is seeing her out, his words are yes, yes, but for God's sake go now. Poirot paused. There, Hastings, take each of those facts one by one, consider them carefully by themselves and in relation to the whole, and see if you do not get new light on the matter. I endeavoured conscientiously to do as he had said. After a moment or two, I said rather doubtfully. As to the first points, the question seems to be whether we adopt the theory of blackmail, or of an infatuation for this woman. Blackmail, decidedly. You heard what Stoner said as to his character and habits. Mrs. Renault did not confirm his view, I argued. We have already seen that Madame Renault's testimony cannot be relied upon in any way. We must trust to Stoner on that point. Still, if Renault had an affair with a woman called Bella, there seems no inherent improbability in his having another with Madame Dorbroil. None whatever, I grant you, Hastings, but did he? The letter, Poirot. You forget the letter. No, I do not forget. But what makes you think that letter was written to Monsieur Renault? Why, it was found in his pocket, and, and. And that is all. Cut in Poirot. There was no mention of any name to show to whom the letter was addressed. We assumed it was to the dead man because it was in the pocket of his overcoat. Now, mon ami, something about that overcoat struck me as unusual. I measured it, and made the remark that he wore his overcoat very long that remark should have given you to think. I thought you were just saying it for the sake of saying something, I confessed. Ah, quel idée. Later you observed me measuring the overcoat of Monsieur Jacques Renault. Eh bien, Monsieur Jacques Renault wears his overcoat very short. Put those two facts together with a third, namely, that Monsieur Jacques Renault flung out of the house in a hurry on his departure for Paris, and tell me what you make of it. I see. I said slowly, as the meaning of Poirot's remarks bore in upon me. That letter was written to Jack Renault, not to his father. He caught up the wrong overcoat in his haste and agitation. Poirot nodded. Precisement. We can return to this point later. For the moment let us content ourselves with accepting the letter as having nothing to do with Monsieur Renault Père, and pass to the next chronological event. 
23rd May. I read, M. Renault quarrels with his son over latter's wish to marry Mart Dorbroil. Son leaves for Paris. I don't see anything much to remark upon there, and the altering of the will the following day seems straightforward enough. It was the direct result of the quarrel. We agree, mon ami, at least as to the cause. But what exact motive underlay this procedure of Monsieur Renault's? I opened my eyes in surprise. Anger against his son of course. Yet he wrote him affectionate letters to Paris? So Jack Renault says, but he cannot produce them. Well, let us pass from that. Now we come to the day of the tragedy. You have placed the events of the morning in a certain order. Have you any justification for that? I have ascertained that the letter to me was posted at the same time as the telegram was dispatched. Masters was informed he could take a holiday shortly afterwards. In my opinion the quarrel with the tramp took place anterior to these happenings. I do not see that you can fix that definitely unless you question Madame Dorbroil again. There is no need. I am sure of it. And if you do not see that, you see nothing, Hastings. I looked at him for a moment. Of course. I am an idiot. If the tramp was George's Conno, it was after the stormy interview with him that Mr. Renault apprehended danger. He sent away the chauffeur, Masters, whom he suspected of being in the other's pay, he wired to his son, and sent for you. A faint smile crossed Poirot's lips. You do not think it strange that he should use exactly the same expressions in his letter as Madame Renault used, later in her story? If the mention of Santiago was a blind, why should Renault speak of it, and, what is more, send his son there? It is puzzling, I admit, but perhaps we shall find some explanation later. We come now to the evening, and the visit of the mysterious lady. I confess that that fairly baffles me, unless it was indeed Madame Dorbroil, as Francois all along maintained. Poirot shook his head. My friend, my friend, where are your wits wandering? Remember the fragment of check, and the fact that the name Bella Devine was faintly familiar to Stoner, and I think we may take it for granted that Bella Devine is the full name of Jack's unknown correspondent, and that it was she who came to the Villa Genevieve that night. Whether she intended to see Jack, or whether she meant all along to appeal to his father, we cannot be certain, but I think we may assume that this is what occurred. She produced her claim upon Jack, probably showed letters that he had written her, and the older man tried to buy her off by writing a check. This she indignantly tore up. The terms of her letter are those of a woman genuinely in love, and she would probably deeply resent being offered money. In the end he got rid of her, and here the words that he used are significant. Yes, yes, but for God's sake go now, I repeated. They seem to me a little vehement, perhaps, that is all. That is enough. He was desperately anxious for the girl to go. Why? Not because the interview was unpleasant. No, it was the time that was slipping by, and for some reason time was precious. Why should it be? I asked bewildered. That is what we ask ourselves. Why should it be? But later we have the incident of the wristwatch, which again shows us that time plays a very important part in the crime. We are now fast approaching the actual drama. It is half past ten when Bella Devine leaves, and by the evidence of the wristwatch we know that the crime was committed, or at any rate that it was staged, before twelve o'clock. We have reviewed all the events anterior to the murder, there remains only one unplaced. By the doctor's evidence, the tramp, when found, had been dead at least forty-eight hours, with a possible margin of twenty-four hours more. Now, with no other facts to help me than those we have discussed, I place the death as having occurred on the morning of 7th June. I stared at him, stupefied. But how? Why? How can you possibly know? Because only in that way can the sequence of events be logically explained. Mon ami, I have taken you step by step along the way. Do you not now see what is so glaringly plain? My dear Poirot, I can't see anything glaring about it. I did think I was beginning to see my way before, but I'm now hopelessly fogged. For goodness sake, get on, and tell me who killed Mr. Renault. That is just what I am not sure of as yet. But you said it was glaringly clear.
Thank you for listening to today's episode. I really hoped you enjoyed it. There will be more to come. Please subscribe not to miss out on what is next. I will be looking forward to your return. The music is by Madfan from Pixabay. To support this and other artists go to pixabay.com. Sheila.